Hi, Alishka. Welcome to Think Super Systemic. Thanks for having me. For sure. Uh, yeah, just to get started, uh, you know, I would like to, for, first of all, uh, you know, maybe you can tell us your age, uh, which is pretty surprising considering the type of work that you're into. Uh, but then follow that up with a little description of how you kind of got onto this advanced academic track uh, and to start starting companies and studying these really intense topics. Yeah, so I'm currently 17 years old and uh, for the past like two to three years, I've been really interested in technology. So I've spent the past few years kind of going really deep into different technology areas, building various different projects. And um, so and, and through that experience, I've also had the chance to work with some really interesting companies. Um, so previous previously, I was heavily involved in the blockchain space. And so I worked on a product in uh, the counterfeit industry, which is, you know, a huge problem in developing countries where nearly 40 to 50 percent of medication that people are consuming can end up being counterfeit or, or not authentic. And so I developed this blockchain product that lets you track that medication through supply chain systems in developing countries um, and actually, you know, help catch some of these counterfeit medications. Um, and so that product ended up getting integrated into some work that IBM Blockchain is doing right now. And through that experience, I've had the chance to work with a uh, few banks in Canada, so TD Bank and CIBC, on applying uh, decentralized frameworks to digital identity um, and finance. So I've also had you know, a little bit of experience in that space where I built a product for helping manage uh, client data on a platform that was a lot more secure and would kind of allow us to plug into third parties and, and provide different services at the banks. Um, and like you mentioned now, I, I'm, you know, heavily kind of involved in machine learning and doing some research there. I've been working on, with Hanson Robotics and San Jose State University on developing different machine learning techniques to improve the manipulation of robots, uh, specifically around uh, like humanoids like Sophia the robot and applying those as well to prosthetics and helping make them easier to use and, and cheaper through uh, 3D printing. So that's just kind of an overview of, of some okay, of the Okay, cool. Great. Uh, and we can dive into a couple of those. But um, can you tell me when did you kind of break off in terms of your academic path from kind of the standard uh, path? I mean, how old were you when you started to really dive into this stuff? I think I was 14 or, or 15. Um, and really, it, it was probably, you know, right when I came into high school, uh, I'm based out of, of Canada. And for me, like, I think I was just really bored of, of of going to school and like doing the same thing over and over again, I would always try to find other things to kind of fuel my time and, and a lot of clubs and, and just being a part of a lot of things. But really, I think the root cause there was I just wasn't enjoying what I was doing at school. Um, and that's really when I started to explore these other passions of mine. Okay. Cool. Maybe we can dive in a little bit on uh, the blockchain stuff. When did, when um, would you say, uh, when did you kind of really get your head into blockchain and realize that there was something really different there that uh, gave uh, uh, kind of a number of new opportunities? And, and where did you really, what was your first blockchain based project that you got into? Yeah, so blockchain, I think it's definitely something that I was very curious about um, when I was, you know, 14 or 15 around around that age as well, when I got started. And for me, it was more of, I think the technology just brought a really interesting perspective on how we can frame different systems in our world. Like if you think about the government, you think about uh, banks, you think about, uh, you know, healthcare institutions, like all of these companies there's always a single authority that kind of controls the data, controls the system. Um, and blockchain brought this new idea of, you know, how can we decentralize these frameworks? So instead of there being the single authority that controls all of the permissions and all of the data and what happens, how do we decentralize that? So we almost have these nodes or, 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 or these systems where we don't have that single point of failure, or that single kind of authority controlling it. And that to me was really interesting because it brought, you know, a lot of different interesting applications like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. That's a common one that, you know, we're hearing about a lot recently mm -hmm. uh, with everything happening in the world. Um, but that's really an application of blockchain, right? I've, I've also spent some time looking at 
uh, ways we can apply it to to like real estate. And, and one kind of unique way to do that is in a fractional home ownership. Um, mm. And essentially fractional home ownership is like, if you think about um, like real estate today, you really only have two options, like either you can rent or you buy, but obviously buying is, is way better. I think there's a stat where, you know, if you're buying a home versus renting, you actually end up making like 64 percent more um income or or you have more kind of equity in in those assets rather than obviously renting and so for me i think you know the framework of fractionalized home ownership is interesting because instead of having to buy the entire house you can almost buy like pieces of it and there's frameworks to help regulate that and and blockchain really fits in well there when it comes to title title ownership like who owns Mm. what and being able to easily Uh, seamlessly track and, and put everything on 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 like these smart contracts is what they call okay. and so that was a one of the recent applications that I was looking at um but you know I've also looked at uh, I'll just mention another one which is around you know digital identity which I mentioned was some of my work at the bank and that is really interesting because a lot of institutions I don't know recently Twitter actually came out and they also ta- are, are working on this group called blue sky that I've been involved with as well. And they're working on actually applying some sort of blockchain type framework to uh, like social media management and, and these online platforms like, like Twitter. Um, and so to, to kind of manage data and manage uh, digital identity, right, of people on the platform. And so that is a, another really interesting application that has implications in, you know, government um, institutions, mm-hmm. financial institutions and healthcare uh, as just a few. Very cool. And so a lot of the hype, obviously, is about the speculation and the price of the, you know, of a couple cryptocurrencies. But would you say, now, in terms of um, the potential for blockchain to change the way we manage properties, as you said, or vehicles or any kind of ownership, how far down the road do you think we are so far? I mean, I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, blockchain is over. But I also get the feeling that we have a long way to go in terms of its impact on society and so forth, specifically with the ideas that you say. So how far would you say we are and and what are you really excited about in the coming decade in terms of blockchain uh, getting used more and more? Yeah, I think right now we're probably still a few years, I think a few years kind of down the road, maybe four to five years until we really start to see things hit off. And I think that's just the natural way that society kind of understands. And and I think there's always almost like a four to five year lag in these things reaching like the common population. If you think about, you know, people in 2014, 2013 were talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and people thought they were insane, right? Like they Mm -hmm. thought this is a crazy idea. Like, like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, And so you know, it wasn't until recently, I think more recently, like we were actually starting to see more people understanding the the cryptocurrency and, and actually investing in it firsthand and experiencing it. So definitely, I think there's always kind of this transition period in just humanity in general before they start to adopt these solutions. And it's going to be similar for applications like real estate, which I think the biggest thing is that they're just heavily regulated. And so mm-hmm. implementing frameworks like blockchain you just really need to tackle the regulations. Right. And if you think about, there's a company called key living and Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if anyone's heard of them, but they're based out of uh, Toronto and, and, and they're actually working on a really interesting platform where you can rent in a house, but um, over time that rent decreases and you start to actually own that house and, and build equity in it. Um, And so it's almost like a rent, rent to equity model, but they're, they're also, you know, looking at incorporating blockchain down the line. And um, so their framework, I think, is another interesting one where they've actually bought out condos like in, in Toronto. And and so they own the residents. So that's the way they've been doing it. Um, And and they're, you know, starting to, to, to populate them with, with people actually using this framework. So I think still a long way to go. And, and there's other companies starting to work on this as well but there's still definitely a lot of barriers that we need to overcome to to get mass adoption okay and would you say most of the innovation right now is happening in the western world or the kind of first world countries uh because it seems like there's a lot of opportunity you know with 
kind of more unstable governments and so forth in a lot of other places as well. 100%. I think that's like where, you know, people aren't necessarily maybe looking at too much. And that's where I think there's actually the most value, which is why for me, when I was working on the blockchain platform for counterfeit medication, I, I realized like that is a huge problem in developing countries where, mm. you know, there is not a proper infrastructure of supply chain or there's no regulations and, and mm-hmm. government authorities actually looking into these issues. And so I think it's, it's two tier because in, in one way it makes it more tricky, right? Like if you're mm-hmm. trying to implement something where there's no regulation and no infrastructure set up, I think it almost makes it harder to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it might also make it easier to break into those markets because it is you know less regulated. There's less requirements that you might have to go through. Mm-hmm. But I agree, like, I think today a lot of the applications are still heavily, you know, um, focused on on crypto. We're starting to see some stuff with um, some other applications, but I think heavily focused on that area and still very first world oriented in terms of where a lot of the innovation is happening. Got it. Very cool. Uh, Yeah, well, I'll be watching your stuff on the blockchain space to see where things go. But um, so now... The other, other two for two other focus areas that you have are machine learning and robotics. Can you just give a little bit uh, about the difference of, to those two for the uninitiated uh, in terms of what machine learning is and what robotics is and kind of how they relate? So machine learning, I, I think, is more of this this way to kind of automate processes and 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 it's building systems and building these algorithms that help us do tasks um, in, in a much kind of more efficient way. And so um, it like it, the way I like to think about it, or at least like the goal of what artificial intelligence is, is to really replicate like the human mind and human intelligence. Um, and although we aren't there yet, you know, if you think about a lot of algorithms, they require a lot of data, high computational power, um, versus our brains, like where we're able to power through so much information and, and perceive mm. it and, and sense it in, in a matter of seconds through the you know neurons in our brains powering very mm-hmm. very quickly. And so, still a lot of these algorithms aren't you know replicating necessarily human intelligence. But that's really I'd say the goal, or that's what really excites mm-hmm. me is like reaching that goal of of creating. Um, these algorithms that are able to replicate the way humans think and make decisions in a way that humans would. Um, and that's really where the kind of intersection of, of robotics comes in because robotics is more uh, of the hardware, right? I, I think it's more of the physical systems and building machinery that allows us to, to apply some of these uh, algorithms. And so that's how I've been doing a lot of my work is you know, how do we develop machines that are more intelligent and more smart mm. and are able to sense better and perceive better using machine learning? And, you know, one application of that is is literally just humanoids, right? Like replicating human mm. robots and applying these techniques to them. And so uh, that's the work I've been doing with Hanson Robotics and working on specifically manipulation techniques to help improve, uh, you know, how robots are able to actually interact with humans. And then mm-hmm. a lot of the, our work is also more heavily focused on the social interactions that robots actually have with humans. And in the, in the industry itself, like, you know, there's Boston Dynamics and there's a lot of other companies that have an approach of um, either it's more focused on, you know, industrial applications or it's more focused on research and actually developing algorithms that replicate like our human cortex brain. And so um, there's different approaches, but the approach we've been taking is more of, of a social approach and understanding, you know, how, when robots are interacting with humans, like how do humans actually feel? Mm. Um, and that's been really interesting to dive deeper into and understand to better help develop these algorithms uh, and approaches. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong. So Hanson Robot- Robotics has the Sophia robot, which I think many people have seen, uh, but they, they and you are particularly working on uh, the way that people perceive uh, Sophia and uh, react uh, with her uh, and so forth. And, uh, and you're kind of developing the algorithms behind it uh, in like, I do you collect data from the reactions of the people or like, can you talk a little bit about that process? Cause that's a little bit of a mystery to me. <laughs> and I think it's really yeah, interesting. I mean- 
it's definitely it's it's more of a so that is like I'd say the overall mission but what I've been working more specifically on is uh the the hand manipulation so like Mm. for humans today like it's a very easy task let's say if you want to grab like a set of keys from your pocket right but if you gave that task to a robot that would actually become like a very complicated task to Mm. do and so that is what i've been focused on is developing a lot of algorithms for uh you know how do we how do we create control systems that allow sophia to move her hand and interact with different objects Um, you know, shake hands with humans and and writing, drawing, like all of these like things that we do on a day-to-day basis that we really Mm -hmm. don't often think about. Um, And so I've been working on kind of the systems behind that. And and, and that in itself is a very complicated task, right? It's it's not just, you Mm -hmm. know, getting that object and and just telling the robot a command to do it. It's, you know, planning how far is the object and then um, actually figuring out, you know, the joints on the robot, like what do the joints need to to do in order to get to that to that object mm. um then there's like sensing and, and understanding you know what is happening in the environment um how do you use that to to better make decisions and so there's been a lot of my work is you know focused on that and running simulations and uh, collecting data that way but i would say we've done a lot of studies where we um, for example, one of our recent studies was, you know, we, we, we told Sophia to lead like a meditation center or se- uh, session. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, through that experience, we, we saw how people felt relaxed or how they didn't feel relaxed. And we're also working on approaches to actually measure, you know, robots consciousness, which is mm-hmm. it's in itself is a whole other kind of discussion, mm-hmm. <clears throat> kind of discussion, mm-hmm. sorry. Um, but that's like another area that we've been looking into is how do we actually measure like consciousness? And so, interesting. Um, and, um, there's other approaches that we're taking there. Okay. And so when Sophia uh, converses with somebody is all the data that she's using and pulling up, is that within her physical body or is there also a connection to a nearby data center that's bringing in kind of that knowledge and information as uh, she speaks and interacts? So that data, I mean, it's it's stored kind of in the control system that is kind of her, her, her kind of controlling system for her speech. Uh, mm-hmm. she, she's kind of a multi-system facet system, right? Like I look at just the, the arms, but there's a lot of other interactions going on um, okay. from, you know, computer vision algorithms in her eye to actually see things and, and uh, identify objects in the environment. There's also like hearing, there's like NLP for speech detection and, and being able mm-hmm. to actually talk and like humans. So all of that is like a multifaceted system, um, okay. an approach that we've been working on developing. And, and so as she's doing that, she's also collecting data on those interactions with people, right. And, and how she speaks and how people speak to her and, and so that helps to improve the, the speech and interactions mm-hmm. that she has with people. Okay. And what would you say on a pure physical basis right now? Maybe this is more uh, a question for the, the, the designers, but on a pure physical basis, how close, uh, like if you were to model a human brain in the current technologies that we have in silicone and so forth, how big would that be? Would, I mean, are we, are we a super, super, is our brains a super, super efficient system that hasn't been even close to kind of modeled yet? It's hard. Like, I think the brain, like the first thing is that we, we don't really understand the brain at a very deep level. Like the brain, I I don't know if this stat is like fully accurate, but we only really understand maybe like 10% of our brain, Mm. right? And and at a high level, we understand the interactions that might happen in our brain, how we process and perceive information, but there's still a lot of, a lot of barriers to applying that to, you know, machine learning algorithms and hardware systems. And I think specifically because of a lot of infrastructural problems, right? If you think about hardware today, there's we're still at a cap in terms of our computational power. And although it's, you know, increasing exponentially, like our computation, um, we're still not at, at the speed of, of humans and being able to, to do computation at that level yet. 
um, or even, you know, the amount of data that we need to train. Like I said, like data is huge when it comes to, to working on uh, training these machines and training these algorithms, because without that, like the, 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 the system doesn't really know what to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so um, our brain is really good at processing information and understanding things quickly versus a machine you have to spend, you know, sometimes months just collecting mm-hmm. data and collecting information. Like I, for, for a lot of the grasping tasks that I'm doing on, on the hand, like for manipulation, um, I had to spend like a few months just collecting data and there are, you know, open set data that exists, but a, a lot of it was, you know, me just having to, to take pictures of, of day to day objects and, and interactions that I was doing um, to build up this data set of over, you know, thousands of, of, of images. And then you take that data set and you have to train the algorithm. And that training itself takes very long today um, mm. because, you know, the, the machine has to learn all of those, all of those patterns and, and things that you're kind of, you're processing it. within it. So I think those are, those are still barriers and we haven't necessarily been able to get to the level of like a human brain and actually modeling it. But there's a lot of, um, there's definitely a lot of like interesting research trying to see, um, I, I can't think of a really interesting research around this space. I think, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards, but okay, they're, cool. they're more focused on, uh, using like, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, maybe you can tell me, uh, so, so what are you excited about in this space specifically in the coming years? Not, um, not just uh, robotics and machine learning, but also uh, blockchain. Is there any convergence of these things? Uh, what's the big, you know, the big thing you're waiting for, you want to be kind of participate in uh, in the coming years? For, for blockchain, I think um, I kind of, I mentioned briefly some of the work Twitter is doing. And, and I think that will be really interesting developing this like framework for, um, around, you know, social media and, and just in general, because we all are using social media and, and, and interacting with, with these systems. And I think if we are able to run that on, on a blockchain system and, and use that to manage data um, and how we use applications, that will be really interesting. Um, I've been looking into um, Sir Tim Berner-Lee. He's, the, he's like the inventor of the World Wide Web and I had mm-hmm. the chance to speak with him as well. And, He's working on actually developing Solid, which is a platform that is completely mm. decentralized. And it's, it's a web application that allows you to separate your data and your application. Um, mm. So you have full ownership over your data. And now, you know, these, these different applications and, and social media apps don't actually own or have that data, but you can mm. choose and pick what applications you want to use and where you want to actually have your data being stored. And I think that is a really interesting framework when we think about the web and and almost how it's become a place that we didn't want it to become right and yeah. that's he says very commonly around the web was just a place to share information but today you know people are developing applications they're monetizing off of other people and and taking data often to do that and so it becomes a huge security issue um i think in the future and mm-hmm. you know although I think a lot of Gen Z might not be very concerned with their data from just conversations I've had. I think it's something that, you know, other generations are, are thinking about and and Mm -hmm. we will be thinking about as we start to see it become a larger problem. Um, And so for me, that, that future is really exciting. And so that is something I'm I'm excited to be a part of. And um, another company called the Hyperledger, they actually create a lot of the governing frameworks in the blockchain space mm-hmm. so companies like ibm blockchain and, and whatnot are actually working with these companies and deploying systems on their applications so that they're actually working on a group uh, called uh, linux foundation public health so if you want to check that out it's it's another really interesting mm-hmm. framework for actually developing a governing institution for COVID-19 vaccines and preparing for future epidemics that might happen. And how do we use blockchain and their framework of Hyperledger to help create uh, you know, the governing body that 
controls the way these these vaccine rollouts are happening and how we're tracking, mm. how we're tracing and distributing these medications, oh, these vaccines cool. globally. Cool. And and that that presumably would happen as a cooperation amongst many different groups, as opposed to kind of a top down governmental CDC type model. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Like they they you know, there's a lot of different people involved. You have you know the government itself, but you also have them, and so they're working with a lot of different partners to okay. to help do this. And so it's definitely a very multifaceted approach. Okay. Um, but I find it to be to be quite interesting, um, not only for you know right now in COVID nineteen, but if you think about future use cases, there's there's you know so many in terms of future epidemics that you know might happen, or just in general, like the way we do healthcare today and and how we can apply that there. Okay, got it. Very cool. And so what's your, what's your status right now? Are you going into, are you going into university now uh, this year or this, uh, this next year? Or what's, uh, where are you going, heading next? Right now I am finishing up my like last year of high school. And so I'm just kind of wrapping that up. Um, okay. And then I have applied to university. So still kind of waiting on a lot of the decisions, but um, it's something that I, I have in the back of my mind. So I, I think depending on what ends up happening next year, if, if COVID persists, then, you know, I would be open to just like working on, on these projects and areas that I I'm interested in right now. Um, but again, it, it's kind of still in the air and in the works. Uh, yeah. so we'll see what happens. I mean, how do you generally feel you, so, sometimes you hear, uh, people like Elon Musk say that, uh, he doesn't even need people that have gone to university and so forth. But how do you feel about that, that possibility that you could just enter work and uh, kind of learn as you go on a job uh, at this point, since you're a self learner, since all these resources are available? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the key thing, right? Like there's, there's so many resources out there. And I think especially with COVID and everything being online, a lot of people are actually not going to university, just realizing that they can actually learn a lot of the content online or, and, and, you know, you need discipline and you need to be able to be a self-starter to do that. But I do think it's possible. Um, and so for me, where I see the value in university is actually more of the community piece and like getting to mm. just experience that, that environment and, and that being in that environment and being around those people and getting those you know, university experiences and meeting new people that is the, the main value. And I think a lot of these institutions that have been around for ages, right? The alumni having like a strong alumni network and being able to connect with people and continue. I would want to think about what makes the most sense. And today I think our world is, is definitely changing where mm. you know you might not necessarily need a university degree to get started in a lot of these fields, but I think there's it's still something that hasn't evolved too much, right? Yeah. Big companies still today are looking for university degrees and that's just kind of the reality of the yeah. matter. Um, but it is, it is definitely changing. Like, you, you know, Elon Musk and a lot of other people definitely are, are changing yeah. that. I mean, he's also promoting Dogecoin. So, you know, what can we say? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think he's just, he, you know, he has like a very, strong need to be on Twitter and to, to post all of these things and, and all these memes. It's just something he yeah. has to do. So Yeah, it's, it's kind of how he interacts with uh, the populace that I think he assumes he should be interacting with. Uh, anyway, well, this has been really uh, very interesting. I'm yeah. uh, really pleased uh, hearing what you're up to and sharing and so forth. Uh, and I appreciate your time. So thanks for jumping on the show. Oh, thanks for having me.